Hello and welcome to this episode of Bad Decisions with Jim Banks. I'm delighted to have on the show today Boris Bachirik, who is a did I did I muller your name, or did I do all right? No, you didn't. It's, oh, there we go. No, you 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 did perfectly fine. Anyway, Boris, <laughs> Boris, it's great to have you here. Boris, Boris is a, a PPC consultant. I, I guess you're just a like. I think when I was reading your bio, it's it sort of talks about Google Ads. You don't do anything other than Google. Is that right? I try not to do anything else besides Google Ads. Yeah. So I get the occasional request for Meta Ads or for something else but I, I like to stick to google ads i think it's it's hard enough to stay on top of things there and all the frequent changes so i like to to stick to google ads yeah. so just to finish off the intro boris is married couple of kids lives in germany he's been a consultant for about 10 years i think or you, you or you've been in the industry about 10 years how long have you you've been consulting so i've i've been consulting for uh, close to four years now so that's uh that the time that I've been self-employed, basically. So I started started uh, working on my own in 2020, so right when the pandemic hit. Prior to that, I actually got hired by a UK travel company. So that's my that was my first foray into, into online marketing. Got trusted with affiliate marketing and Google AdWords, uh, how it was called at the time. And uh, then I did the usual circuit, you know, the agencies working in-house, until I decided to, you know, so I might might as well go out on my own. So yeah, I've been been around. So you decided to go out on your own because you, I mean, usually the reason people go out on their own is because they either get laid off or they, they you know, they they get fired or whatever. I mean, yeah. you know, you just said I, I'm, I want to take control of my own destiny. Yeah, truth be told, I think it was a mixture of both. So I, I, I realized that I had gotten unemployable, so to speak. I mean, I've I've seen a lot. I've I've done a lot and, uh, you know, to have a 20 something tell you, Boris, you better be at your desk at 8.30 each morning or else it's not going to fly at one point. So I, you know, I, I knew it was, it was the right time for me to be doing this. Plus I had a nice contract lined up. So the decision was, was not so hard. That made it oh, easier. Totally, yeah, yeah. Got to pay the bills right before you, before but you go out. What do you, what do you see the big, the big challenges between consulting and working in house or working for an agency? What, what do you see the differences? I think. One of, one of the cons of working in-house certainly is that you can really put your head down and concentrate on this one thing that you're trying to achieve with the company, right? So whether that be your role as a PPC manager or you're doing SEO or analytics or whatever, or you're doing a mixture of both, right? You can, you, you know, over time, you'll you'll learn the ins and outs of the business and you'll generally get a very good grasp of how things should be running. At least that's my experience. Whereas a consultant is not more challenging per se, but I think there's more new scenarios being thrown at you constantly. So it might be like yeah. the, the typical case of consulting with a client, or it might be someone needing a very specific solution to a very specific problem they might be having. Or a thing that I'm experiencing right now, working with an agency and they need me to do very hands-on work in the account. So it's a mixture of everything. And I I think I enjoy that more than you know doing the same thing over and over again. Just get bored over time fairly, fairly quickly. Like just to finish off completely the bio, <laughs> you, you came to my notice primarily but because of marketing Twitter or whatever whatever it's okay. called now yeah. X, right uh you know I, I mean we were talking in the green room and boris said that he's he's had his uh twitter account i'll, I'll always call it twitter i don't care what same. anyone says i'm going to call it twitter till till, yeah, end, till, right? till they shut it down um, in the same way that i'll always call meta facebook right and i'll always call google google not alphabet or yes. whatever they call it, yes. call it right the only thing i won't do is i won't call it google adwords because it's not google, AdWords, it's google AdWords. but that's by the by so and you you came to my my notice because a lot of the stuff that you posted on link, uh, mm -hmm. on Twitter was primarily to do with memes, right? You kind of like again, you've become <laughs> for me one of the kind of go to people for uh, digital marketing memes. Yeah. So what made what made you decide that that was kind of good thing to do? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, I don't know. It's sort of taken on a life of its own for sure. So. Um, I don't post memes regularly on, on Twitter anymore. I think I, I do it on LinkedIn every Monday. So every Monday is me Monday, basically. Uh, but it just came. It just yeah. came from 
obviously, I think a lot of frustrations around Google Ads and, and reps and the way that agencies and clients maybe are being treated uh, by Google. So I decided to pour some of that frustration into memes. Turns out I'm yeah. really good at making memes. Um, but I want to make a point that I'm not only like the meme guy, even though people refer to me as the, the meme king, but I think... I think yeah. there's also something to be learned from a meme. If you do it properly, then it can absolutely convey a message. So it's not just trolling Google or manhandling them in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, because I mean, one of the things I, I'm, I'm noticing with certainly with with sort of meta advertising in particular, mm -hmm. um, there are so many people that are talking about you know you've got to have this structure. You've got to have like the first three seconds. It's got to be a hook, and you've got to be punchy. Three, you know, yeah. quickly changing the scene and everything mm -hmm. else. Right. And again, I think so much of it is contextual. It really Absolutely. depends what clients you're working with, what, what, you know, what they're trying to achieve. I'm, I'm working with some clients where if I was running those types of ads, we'd never sell a single thing because it just doesn't resonate with the audience. The audience tends to be an older audience, more discerning, probably yeah. a bit more yeah. mature, maybe a little bit more yeah. money. Right. In which case they're just not going to be taken in by, you know, 20. Again, it amazes me when you see these 20 something, you know, females putting on skin mm. cream and i'm thinking you don't need anything on your skin like when you get yeah. older absolutely yeah. but like right now absolutely I, th I think i think that trend is predominant in, in mainly d2c twitter i guess there's also this this trend that i've well, it's not a trend anymore make ugly ads I, i'm sure you've heard of that as well so yeah but yeah. as you said yeah. i mean at some point in time i Trying to see if I can get Barry hot on to, uh, to onto the podcast to talk about uh, yeah. make make ugly ads again. I, I've always maintained I've I've created some of the most ugly ads <laughs> ever that in, in performed incredibly exactly. well. <laughs> so, like you said, it's it's highly you know I, I, highly contextual. If you're if you're selling like a high ticket SaaS subscription to a company, then I think an ugly ad is not going to cut it in most cases. Yeah. I mean, I, I think one of the uh, one of the clients I work with they sell a sort of a product for for dogs with hip and joint problems and one of the one of the ads I created for them they sent me a video it's always difficult to try and get videos of dogs with hip and joints because it's like mm -hmm. it's it's painful yeah. to watch so they sent me a, a video of a, an old labrador getting up off the ground walking over to a water bowl and drinking out of the water bowl <laughs> right we ran that ad for probably 8 to 8 to 10 months yeah. We probably generated a million dollars worth of sales. Mm. I mean, it was like one of the most hideous yeah. ads you've ever seen. I've I, I've lost count of how many video views this particular ad got because really the, the the everyone loves a Labrador, sure, right? yeah, yeah. and it was really the words that went with the 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 creative piece of it, mm. the video ad asset was less relevant than the, the words that went yeah. with it. And I've always maintained that that's one of the challenges. And and how are, how are you finding that now with Google? Because obviously Google, I think, are trying to get in on some of the ad, right? They're trying to capture some of the, because Google's always been a people go looking yeah. for something specific, yeah. whereas, you know, social, social advertising, that's not what they're there for. Whereas I think with demand gen, I think that's really been mm. there to give you more exposure to people that are mess, maybe not looking for things. They're looking for maybe awareness and that sort of thing. Yeah, I so I think that's absolutely Google's play with that particular product, for sure. So and that's also something that's often said on on Twitter and LinkedIn, that if you're a paid social advertiser and you're doing well on Meta or TikTok or whatever, it's quite an easy play to just take your best creatives and put them in a demand gen campaign and see how that how that does for you. So this, yeah. yeah. But I think people try and do the reverse. They try and bring their best sort of social ad and bring it into Google search and it just really doesn't work at all. That I don't know actually if, if that doesn't work or if it or if it works, I think it's it's a probably a misunderstanding from from people who come from paid social. So, like you like you said at the beginning of this segment, paid social is probably the place where people hang out to connect with friends or you know just to watch a couple of videos while while they're on the subway or you know from on the way back home from work. So that's when you show them ads for things they don't know that they want or that they need. 
Whereas Google search obviously is this very straightforward thing where people go to that search box and they type in a, a very specific problem that they have. And that's the way it used to be for the last 20 years, right? Buy handbag, show them ads for handbag. They buy, they don't buy. It's like very binary. Yeah, yeah. but you know that that real estate is probably pretty saturated right now. And that's why Google is pushing increasingly products like demand gen, performance max. Obviously, YouTube ads has have, have been a thing for, for a long while now um, because they want to capture people that are higher up that funnel so they can, you know, advertisers can obviously drive demand or, or brand awareness, but also they want quite clearly a piece of that pay social cake. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I, I mean, I, I had um, Nava Hopkins on to, to talk uh, about sort of mm. PPC because obviously, again, I'm, it's been my sort of my core competency for yeah. forever. So to talk to my peer group, you're always amazing so it's again it's great to have you on um but when i was talking to, to nava we were talking about how a lot of advertisers would run youtube ads and google display network campaigns and gmail mm-hmm. campaigns and they would perform horribly because they just didn't understand how they worked and i think really in some mm-hmm. respects the onset of pmac was, was partly driven by that it was driven by they lost advertisers who had mm-hmm. tried it failed walked away somewhere yep. else and google wanted to keep the money on their platform so they said well let's create an, an ad that will create it mm. for you rather than you trying to do it butchering it in a bad way what are, what are your kind of thoughts on that i think that may may hold some truth for sure so if i if i think back to my first foray into display or youtube i mean obviously i was younger and i didn't know as much than i do now but for sure i mean you're running a YouTube campaign for two weeks and not seeing any sale, like being tracked through that. That's kind of like, hmm, what's going on here? I mean, obviously now I know much better and I know to wait and I know that that exposure is going to manifest somewhere else, not necessarily in that YouTube campaign. So I think, yes, Performance Max is a way that Google has to, you know, have people buy YouTube ads and display ads, but also give them that performance that they're probably lacking when they're running YouTube on its own. Then yeah. on the other side, that may also be sort of a compromised product in the end, uh, but the jury's still out of that, of course. I've been running ads on Google <laughs> since the very first day they started. Do so, you run? I, um, I, and it's always... Been- sorry to interrupt. Did you did you yeah. actually run ads on no, no. Overture? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Overture was yeah. amazing. So I, I just I just got into a bit of a discussion with a guy on LinkedIn the other day, and he tried to school me on Google Ads and how long he had been in the game. And you, you don't even know how to set your Overture bids. And I'm like, what is this person talking about? For Christ's sake! <laughs> it's funny enough. I mean, again, I've been doing it yeah. so long. I even was running ads before Overture existed. So so the first iteration of Overture was called GoTo, oh. and then it changed name to Over, and then Overture got bought by okay. Yahoo, I think for, again, 170 million, I think was what they what they paid for Overture. But yeah, mm. but I mean, again, I, I loved the fact that you could see the search yeah. volume, everything was transparent, yeah. which I guess probably brings me to privacy, because I, I know Google have started to withhold a lot of mm-hmm. the data around search terms yeah. that kind of triggered the cost. So what what are your kind of views on that? I know, I know a lot of people are very angry about that. What's, what's your view? I want to say I'm not angry, but I am sort of. I get the point around privacy for sure. So there, I mean, I can, I can think of many scenarios where it'd be beneficial to withhold the actual search term that triggered an ad. Thinking like a local lead gen campaign and some, you know, maybe a very specific disease or a divorce lawyer or what have you. So these are all cases where I can understand that whole movement around privacy. And now, lately, of course, there's there have been increasing laws around privacy, especially in the EU. So that that adds another layer of complexity to the whole to the whole thing. Now, I think it's a bit shady, that all being said, it's a bit shady of Google to withhold like two thirds of search term and just bucket them under other search terms. And then they'll show us search terms yeah. that had maybe one impression. I can see that, but I can't see the thing that actually drove cost. So that's not very logical to me. But the the official communication always is, yes, that's absolutely because of privacy laws and you need to trust us on that. And I find that hard to believe sometimes 
especially, you know. The, the thing is, I mean, I always use the analogy. I have a, a an allergy to, to shellfish. Mm-hmm. So I, if I have like lobsters or prawns or something yeah. like that, I love the look of them on a plate. Yeah. But if I eat them, eat them I'm going to be like, I'm going to be pretty. Uh, yeah. And it's all, imagine I walk in and I ask them, you know, about the menu and they go, we, we can't tell you about that, but it's going to be $40 for you to buy this yeah. meal. I'm going to go, oh, I'm not, not really sure I'm going to do that. So in, so, in some respects, it's, again, as an advertiser, mm. there are things that you want to be associated with and things you don't yeah. want to be associated with. So I know that you can have a master keyword list. So again, if mm. you were like, you know, Gucci or Lamborghini or something like that, you wouldn't want to, to have cheap, cheap handbags or cheap yeah, this yeah, yeah. or cheap that, you know, so you would have, you would probably again. I've always get. I've always maintained. I mean, like cheap is very subjective. Yeah. What might be cheap to you could be really expensive to somebody else, and mm. vice versa. So, in some in some respects, like saying let's exclude cheap completely or free or whatever it might be. I mean, you know, although people are looking for free, they may be quite happy to pay for it if the price is okay. So sometimes you might be excluding yourself from an auction that maybe you ought to be in. And I, but I think that that's where sometimes that keyword data can really help to unlock some of the, well, that's a positive. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do more of that. That's a negative. I'm going to do less of that. And I think that's always the challenge when you're trying to do that analysis with data that you don't have. I think it's only going to get yeah. worse as we move to, forward. To that point, I totally agree with you. And I think it's, it's actually counterproductive for Google in a way to be withholding some of those search terms from us because quite obviously if it's driving conversions and it's it's got positive metrics throughout then i'm gonna be willing to spend more on that but i can only spend more on the things that i know and that i see right so getting yeah. back to that analogy like you're going to the restaurant and you're you're ordering lobster for 40 pounds and then like half of what you get on your plate they actually slip you shellfish without you knowing so that's 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 a bit fishy so so boris one, one of the th- again one of the things that I'm, I'm always interested in the ppc community is very close tight-knit yeah. everyone knows each mm-hmm. other I, I don't know if you feel the same way but it's a, again it's a good community oh, to be yeah. in but again it's it's one of one of the the big challenges is sometimes the that there is the kind of the the onus of, again Google are doing it, Meta are doing it, Microsoft are doing it, where they're basically introducing AI mm-hmm. and saying, well, oh, actually, this this is going to resolve all the problems. What are, what are your kind of thoughts around AI in the Google Ads ecosystem? I have many thoughts around that. Um, and personally, I'm, I'm very intrigued by that whole notion of AI. And uh, I think that that we are now seeing that. So if you if you think of the law of, of how, how is it called? Accelerated rate of improvement or something? Do you know what I'm talking about? So yeah. anyway, this is going yeah, to be yeah. super unscientific. But if you if you take um, the, the rate at which we um, increase our knowledge, basically, we're just at the bottom of that of that curve, right? So where everyone is now excited about AI, imagine like where we're going to be in 10 years from now. So I think the perspective or, or the outlook for me is rather positive. Now, what's what's being done with AI right now from, from many of these platforms is not always the right thing. Um, so we need to understand that that's also driven by the need to produce shareholder value and, and increase revenue and, and all that good stuff. I think all in all, I'm I'm rather excited about AI and how it's going to change the way we work and maybe hopefully also the produ- the, the results that we're going to be able to produce. Yeah, because I, th- I think I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm partially skeptical. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think part of it is because I think there's a lot of marketing speak that goes with it. It mm-hmm. just makes the assumption that they're the only people that can possibly know what is going to work best for your clients, right? And I, again, I've maintained they don't understand some of the complexities on the back end. Yeah. They only see what happens on the front end. If you're a, a business that's selling, let's say you're selling a subscription-based model, you, you're lifetime value could be huge yep. but your initial purchase cost you're tra- you're competing with people that maybe are not running a subscription model and google lumps you in with everyone else they just assume that everyone is exactly the same um, yeah I, th- I think the, the the problem is sometimes that it's missing 
the input from the end user. So Google never asks you for any input. Tell us about your business. Yeah. Tell us what your objectives are. Tell us what your, again, you, you give them a TCPA or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. Great, we'll try and work towards that. But they're miles out of it. They're either miles over or miles under. They never hit the, the right spot. And I think that's one of the challenges is that they don't ask enough questions. I mean, I, I did an exercise yesterday. So so OpenAI came out with chat GPT yeah. for zero. That's been all the chatter. I don't even yeah. know. Is it 4.0 or 4 I, Who knows anymore? I don't. I don't. <laughs> um, so again, one of the examples that they said is, uh, you know, I think, I'm trying to think what it was, but it was something like, I've got a photo shoot tomorrow. Can you suggest uh, an outfit for me to wear? So I put oh. that in, into the chat, and it came back, and it came up with, you should wear a nice dress and a blouse and a skirt. And I'm thinking, well, surely the first thing they should be doing is to say, well, what gender yeah. are you? What age yeah, yeah, are yeah. you? What's the what the occasion? I mean, you know, what's your mm. kind of target audience? Are you doing it for LinkedIn? Are you doing it for Facebook? What's the end product going to look mm. like? And from there, I'm sure they would do. I mean, again, once I made some tweaks to it and did some refinements of the initial, you know, query, mm. I ended up with okay, well, that's probably okay. I could probably run with some of the yeah, suggestions yeah. that they've yeah. made, but it took lots of backwards and forwards from me, me instigating the backwards and forwards, not them asking the mm. questions. It was me yeah. prompting yeah. them to, to say, well, oh, by the way, I'm this age, and I'm <laughs> this gender, and I'm this, and I'm that. Yeah. You know? I get so, that. Uh, well, There's so many different ways we could take this, this, this talk now. First of all, if I'm referring back to some things you said earlier about, you know, the, the input that you need to give the machine and, you know, the, you gave the the example of the subscription model that probably has a much higher lifetime value than like a one-off sale. Um, my answer to that is, wasn't that the case all along? So I remember when we used to run campaigns on manual CPC and the way to do things was to calculate backwards from your AOV and your conversion rate and then come up with your maximum profitable CPC, right? How is that different to now. Yeah. So that is, don't want to sound harsh, but that to me is not a valid argument because I think you should have always, you yeah. should have always realized like what's the value a click brings to, to that business? What's the value of a conversion? Like work with the client and really strive to understand what they're trying to achieve. And then of course there are different ways to do this if they want to scale aggressively. You don't need to make a profit on the first order if they are trying to increase profits. On the other hand, then there's probably other things that you should be doing and so on and so forth. And then... Yeah, because again, I think I think sometimes there's the ancillary benefits. I think a lot mm -hmm. of the, the benefits, so again, what, I think one of the challenges at the moment, so we see a lot of situations where historically with the Facebook pixel, it used to be that Facebook would take credit but virtually every single sale that yeah. was made on your yeah. site because the, the pixel fired everywhere. Yeah. Then they introduced the, uh, the iOS 14.5 uh, mm -hmm. update and that kind of changed it and all of a sudden that kind of went yeah. out the window, right? When you look at it now, you're never going to get kind of 100% accurate mm. data. Some of it is going to be assumed assume that, that based on all the patterns of what we saw, we assume that a sale took place, but we have no yeah. idea whether it was a sale for a dollar or... A, a thousand dollars. You worked in travel. I always remember when I worked for a travel company, the value for us, because we were selling clicks, we were selling outbound clicks to uh, airlines and online mm -hmm. travel agents. So the value of us to a click was exactly the same, whether it was somebody that was, let's say somebody in the UK looking to fly from London to Amsterdam mm -hmm. return on EasyJet yeah. versus somebody looking to fly in first class to Singapore <laughs> in British Airways, it didn't matter. That They, they were yeah. worth the same mm -hmm. value to us, but clearly worth a lot more to oh, the absolutely. airline and the online travel yeah, yeah. agent if that person subsequently went and mm -hmm. made a book. But ultimately, our model was one we were happy with, comfortable yeah. with. We were mon monetizing the outbound clicks at a multiple. So we would buy a click for, say, 20 mm -hmm. cents, and we would sell it four or five times for 50 cents. So it was like hugely profitable in mm -hmm. that regard. But I think, again, I think if you lay out your, this is what a, a sale is worth to me. This is how much I can afford. Mm -hmm. That's always the, the kind of challenge. I get clients call, call me up and say, Jim, Google's suggesting we increase our TCPA to $50 yeah. or whatever. And I'm like, but that doesn't tie in with what you've said 
your kind of profit margin is on that initial kind of sales. What's the point in trying to generate sales at $50 if you're losing Mm -hmm. money hand over fist as a result of that? If you again, if you knew that the lifetime value based on the next 24 months was going to be ten thousand dollars, sure. knock yourself yeah. out. You could probably go to a thousand dollars for an yeah. acquisition, right? Because you know that you're going to make yeah. profit. But but again, that, that's that's information that I don't ever think unless you send the data back to Google through adva- enhanced conversion mm-hmm. data, they ever know about that happening. So for them, it's certainly in, in lead gen. For them, lead gen is it's binary. It's ones and zeros. A lead was generated or a lead wasn't generated, right? There's no intrinsic value to the lead because it relies on factors that are outside of their control. They can't control how good the salesperson that picks up the phone or anything like oh, that yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. Right? But equally, I can say this actually, that, that click that you sent me that cost me $3 or whatever it might be, that translated into a $10,000 sale. It might be, again, the the one thing I don't like is I think with Google's um, enhanced conversion window with the GCLID, you can only have a 90-day window. And most the big, bigger kind of sales, there are much lengthier sales process. And 90 days is nowhere near long enough to be able to pass that information back. That's that's absolutely correct. Yeah, that's that's one of the gripes I have with with the GCLID upload as well. Um, That leaves you with no other option than to guesstimate do the calculations from conversion rates through through all the different steps you may have in your in your lead funnel, and then assign the value to to that one conversion that has enough data amassed that you can actually optimize towards for for Google. And that's yeah, that's hit and miss very often. Now there there have been some interesting talks between Google and HubSpot for for an acquisition. Don't know if you've if you've heard of that, but I mean, if that ever Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's actually been going on for for a couple of weeks, I guess. So if that ever happened, I think that'd be a very good sign for advertisers for a more direct and seamless integration. I mean, there's already a native integration for for HubSpot inside of the Google Ads UI. Um, but yeah, I see. So from that aspect, I I see some positive signals also for for B two B advertisers. Yeah, because I mean, I I've I've always looked at the. The ecosystem. I mean, one, again, one of the challenges is sometimes, again, you you know, the, the clients don't have the technical capabilities to do the implementation yeah. of <laughs> tracking and all that sort of stuff to give you what you want. And I've, I've always maintained that not all clicks are worth the same. If somebody clicks, great, it's a click. But if somebody clicked and that they spent three minutes on the site, they read three pages, yeah. they got to the bottom of the page where your you know, call to action is, Again, we, we spend a lot of time in Lucky Orange looking at like people's kind of interactions with the yeah. site to understand we've got a call to action button in the right place. If if people are going to 50% of the page, but the call to action button's at 75%, we're missing out on the opportunity. So we could probably say, well, let's just move that call to action button a little bit higher yeah. on the page, right? So it, again, it's not we're, we're always looking at, it's not just the clicks and conversions it's also the clicks and the non-converters and why did they not convert right was there something we can do to try and push them closer to to completing whatever it is that the conversion mechanism is that's actually one of the reasons why i always ask my clients to give me access to their crm that i get access to any recordings of calls if possible that i get access to to all the backend data to all the sales values that that actually got generated <clears throat> excuse me because only by by looking at the whole sales funnel and and the, the conversion steps afterwards can can you really assess the effectiveness of your campaign like you rightfully said if someone submitted a lead that doesn't mean anything to me or if someone clicked on on the yeah call us button or you know click through 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 an ad like i'm interested in how quickly is the sales team in actually picking up the phone. Do they call people back? What's with chats yeah. on the website? Is that being maintained or just people like going to the chat and then sitting idle for 10 minutes and leaving? That's all valuable information. And uh, only by by being able to, to see all of that data, I think, can you also educate your client on the importance of I mean, that's almost operational things, right? So you're being like a coach to them you can tell them you spent 
150 euros for someone to click on your chat button and nothing ever happened with that person. Do you think that person is ever yeah. going to come back? Or does, does that person have five other tabs open with competitors of yours that are quicker to pick up the phone or get back to you? Um, so almost, almost. Yeah. And I think, I think, again, I think, I think when you look at certain types of, of industry, again, like if, if you're in sort of a technical B2B sales, if somebody has like a 15 field form to fill mm -hmm. in with loads of information about the company and the size of the company and turnover and all that sort of stuff, they're not going to go to seven different companies to try and get quotes from, <laughs> yeah. right? They're going to go, whoever gets through to me first, is going to probably have a much, much better chance. I think what came out with the stat that it's something like you've got a seven times more likelihood of closing a deal if you get back to somebody within an hour of them actually filling in a form or whatever it might be. And again, there's there's so many companies that they that again we we if you run your ads 24 seven, which we definitely think you should, mm -hmm. you've got to make sure that there's a mechanism in place to capture. So again, it could be you have Nine to five, you've got like people answering the phone. After five o'clock, they go to a chat bot where they can yeah. fill in some information and kind of request a callback or whatever it might be. But but there's there's so many different ways, as you say, operational things that I think a lot of agencies and consultants don't pick up. They don't pick up that type of stuff. And I think so much of it, I've I've always maintained that Google Ads is very easy if you've joined all the dots between all the components of the customer's business to ensure that you're not leaving money on the table. There's loads of leakage if you leave the leakage unplugged. You've got to plug them in and make sure that, that there's nowhere for the for stuff to go. Absolutely. That comes with experience, I guess. So I'm, I'm sure you used to be the same. I mean, there was a time when I was of the opinion that I sent relevant traffic from Google, like the rest is none of my business. That was this six years ago or so. So that took me also a lot of time to realize that there's other aspects that are equally, if not more important, the landing page, the offer, speed to lead. Like you said, if how quickly are people to get back to you? I have actually a, a personal anecdote um, for that. So I was, I was trying to find a contractor to tear down my old garage and build a new one and also remodel our garden. So that would have been like a 30K contract for someone. And I couldn't for the life of me find someone yeah. in my city that would get back to me from the forms I filled out on their website. Not a single one. I had to rely on, oh. on, on a neighbor and a recommendation. So someone, I, I got someone through that. And that is insane to me. Absolutely insane. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy to think that there's loads, of, and there must be so many scenarios like that yeah. all over the place where, like I said, people are leaving money on the table. Yeah. Right? So I've got 30,000 euros here. Take Please. my money. Exactly. <laughs> and they're just they're not interested. Can't be bothered. Okay. <laughs> so, so, Boris, I know that in the community as a whole, the PPC sort of community as a whole, we have a – slightly different viewpoint as far as reps go. So yeah. what, what's your kind of thoughts on Google reps and what value they add? You came to the, just the right person to ask that question. I'm not sure if you know, but I actually applied at Teleperformance last year and I got the job offer. And in that process, of, I did. did, of course I did. And that in itself is insane to me because they could have just went on Google and typed in my name and be like, well, that's probably not someone who's going to relocate to Spain or Portugal and like work for 20,000 euros. But yeah, I went through a whole round of interviews with a recruiter and then with a team and then with the team lead. And they asked all sorts of different questions and none of them were even related to Google Ads. So they didn't want to know if I had experience with Google Ads. Obviously, I told them that, but that was not a prerequisite. All these third-party companies care about is your sales experience and how you do under pressure and in high-pressure environments. And I think that also explains the trouble that many advertisers are having with reps. And I think most of the bad rep that Google get for you know how reps handle accounts and client relations and 
how they go over the agency or the freelancer handling an account straight to the client that comes from the third party reps because they are incentivized just by sheer volume and they have to hit certain numbers you know, to, to, to get that bonus. So yeah, that's, that's a funny personal anecdote. And then like the Google reps. Yes. I, 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 the reality of it, it's been like that forever. Yeah. It's, I mean, I think the only time it didn't apply was pre IPO Google. So the minute Google became a public traded company, Everything changed, I and in my view, it changed for the world. I don't know. So when I was when I was working in house in Switzerland, we had excellent reps. Of course, they were also constantly haggling us for more budget, and they were ringing up our CEO. Hey, Q four is around the corner. How's your stance on increasing the budget by five times or something? That happened. Yeah. But also they were super helpful and you could always get them on the phone and you'd get invited to Google in Zurich or you'd get invited to the Google shopping days or what have you. So that it was, in my opinion at least, it used to be very different, more like a corporation. So Google obviously give us support and, and we give them to the best of our ability, what they need, which is more budget, but obviously we have to spend it responsibly. So that's, I think, where where the clash always happens because Google doesn't see spending responsibly as their main focus. Yeah, I've always maintained I, I have a mutual hate-hate relationship with Google. We, we probably hate each <laughs> other because, I'm again, I'm very outspoken, always okay. have been. And I'm sure they don't like it. But at the same time, I know I have to work with mm. them. I respect they, they're doing their job. I just, again, I just wish they they didn't employ some of the tactics that they do. I mean, when they send an email to say, well, if you don't do this, then we're not going to be able to support you. It's like, why, why does the amount of money we spend matter to, to you being able to support us? You would think that they would want to support every single advertiser that yes, they have in the best way that they can. Because not, again... Not every advertiser is a Fortune 500 company with unlimited pockets. I mean, even Fortune 500 companies don't have unlimited deep pockets where they can spend as much as they want. They still need mm. to achieve certain corporate objectives yeah. with the money that they're spending on advertising. Oh, absolutely. So. Absolutely. The eBay fiasco comes to mind a couple of years back when, when they publicly announced that Google Ads wasn't working for them and they stopped all spend. I mean, that backfired in a big time, big way for them. And also, I think people yeah. were quick to point out that they were just bidding on every word in the dictionary, regardless if it makes sense or not. But to your point, you need to spend money in a way that you're able to spend money next year and then the year from now, because otherwise you're going you're gonna to go out of business. And we don't want to go out of business. So, yeah, agreed. It's yeah, I think, I think that, was the, that was the joke. With with, with uh, dynamic keyword, research, yeah, that was right. That. With e as you say, with yeah. eBay, it was uh, find everything, right? I think they find death on eBay. Use use <laughs> something, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely, mm. yeah. Because I think again, I think dynamic keywords great when they work, but when they don't work, they work don't work horribly. Mm. So, yeah, that's that's true. But I mean, SEO comes into play uh, with with dynamic search ads. In a, in a big way. So if, if Google doesn't, yeah. first of all, if Google doesn't understand what your website is about, then no need to be running dynamic keyword. And as I said, then best to work on your data on the website and your content. And then Google will be able to understand what it is you're trying to sell, hopefully. So Boris, just, just I mean, we're probably getting close to running out of time, but one of the things I'm always curious when people are consulting, mm -hmm. if, whether they're consultants, self-employed, whatever they call themselves, yeah. I've always maintained that pretty much every single day you wake up and you're unemployed and you've got to go looking for work every yeah. single day because yeah. of that. Whereas if, at least if you work for a company, you've got the security of an employment contract, you get paid mm -hmm. holidays and yeah. all that sort yeah. of stuff. How do you balance that? How do you find the time with your family and your children and holidays and all that sort of stuff being a consultant that's that's a hard thing to to achieve actually very often so yeah admittedly there have been times where business has been very low or it had been it had it dried up and 
in, in these scenarios, I mean, obviously it's always helpful to have a couple of months of, of saving in the bank somewhere. So when business dries up, you're, you're actually able to pay a mortgage and put food on the table and send your kids to dad's class or whatever. But I've, I've learned to live with that uncertainty. I think I'd, I'd much rather have that freedom to, to decide who to work with and when to work instead of being forced to return to the office as, as it's been a thing lately again and work for clients that maybe you wouldn't want to work with or yeah. So that's, that's one aspect. And then, so what, what sort of criteria, yes. what, what sort of criteria do you use for kind of choosing the clients that you work with or not working well, with? First of all, they're going to have proof of concept. So it's got to gotta be a product or a service that people actually want um, because I can't just set up the Google ads and then all of a sudden they're failing business like rakes in millions. That's not how it works. So it's got to be something where I'm confident that I can make it work. They, all, they already have sales coming in from organic or paid social or whatever. So that's one aspect of it then obviously the other aspect is they need to have a somewhat healthy budget and the third aspect i think that's almost the most important one is they i gotta enjoy working with them so the very minute i get on a call with someone and i have this like ah, bad feeling about them or i just i rather not work with them or ah oh, this guy again i gotta present like the failing campaign and he's gonna be all up over me like cussing me out or something that's not something i want to have to tolerate anymore so that's my litmus test of do i enjoy working with this person yeah. could i imagine sitting down over a cup of coffee and just talk to them not about business but about anything that's almost or even more important to me. family yeah. i just sport yeah no time for negative nellies for, for sure yeah. like i've i've been there and it's it's not fun no for mm. sure so Boris, I, I, I get like I said, we could probably talk for for absolute we hours. Could. All your all your contact details will be in the show notes to to the uh, the episode, yep. and th those will be available when we publish the episode. Uh, it only remains for me to say thank you so much for being a fantastic guest today. And uh, yeah, I mean, if if there's if is there anything that you would like to sort of say to the get the the kind of the audience before kind of we we, we wrap up? Oh, you put me on the spot there. I don't I don't know, Jim. Probably just enjoy the process, whatever. I didn't know. This is your opportunity. I don't, I don't. I don't have anything to plug. I don't have a course. I don't have anything I want people to buy. If anything, I have a friend of mine, Michael, and we are doing a weekly live hangout each Friday at three PM Central European time. Um, so if people are interested, they can always shoot me a message over on Twitter or LinkedIn, and I'll send them the Zoom invite, and they can ask any and all questions about Google ads uh, that they want. That's sort of our weekly tradition to cap off the week. Very cool. Okay. Well, that's great. Thank you again. Like I said, Boris, thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, I look forward to at some point in time, maybe we will get the opportunity to hang out in person. I get, again, I don't know if you do any speaking at conferences, but um, I'm trying to get back onto the speaker circuit. Uh, but if you did any speaking, then maybe we can mm. um, find an opportunity to grab some time together in, in person. Yeah. First of all, thanks for having me. Secondly, I never did any speaking. Just last year, I did a couple like small scale online presentations, but I'm absolutely interested in maybe getting into speaking. Now, I think my sort of... Well, clearly you're very knowledgeable. Yeah. Very affable, personable. I think you'd have no issue with it. Whatsoever. So <laughs> Thanks. Good. All right. Well, we'll talk to you at some point in time soon. And uh, everyone, thanks for listening in to the episode. And we'll see you on the next episode of Bad Decisions with Jim Banks. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs>